Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this final day of lessons about the Safari and MMI Winter School on Soft Robotics. It is with my great pleasure that I introduce to you Fabrizio Flacco, my colleague and friend, which we talk about the stiffness estimation, which is a very hot topic in the field of soft robotics. Thank you, Giorgio. Okay, uh, so I'm, as uh, Giorgio said, I'm Fabrizio Flacco from the Sapienza University of Rome. And today I will talk to you about uh, the estimation of the stiffness of uh, a flexible transmission in general and uh, variable stiffness actuator in particular. Uh, why is this is important? If you, okay, during these days you have seen many applications with variable stiffness actuators. Uh, you have seen many control uh, uh, strategies. And you have seen that, for example, uh, variable stiffness actuators can be used for, uh, for safety because you can use the components of the transmission and you can set the stiffness in order to have a, a safer robot. Actually, there is also someone that said, okay, uh, a soft robot, robot, a compliance actuator can be also uh, more dangerous than uh, a classical uh, rigid robot. Um, in my opinion, it depends on how do you use it. I mean, if you are able to use it uh, in a good way, you can exploit the safe behavior of your uh, transmission. If you are not able to do that, you cannot, you, you have a, a danger robot, because clearly with the compliant transmission you've seen, for example, in the, the optimal control, you can store the energy, and if you release this energy during a contact, clearly this is uh, very, very dangerous. Uh, so in this, um, with this in mind, the stiffness estimation is very important because you have seen in any control strategies, for example, you have seen uh, PD control for regulation, you've seen uh, gravity cancellation, feedback linearization, uh, uh, time and uh, energy optimal control. In all the strategies, uh, in some point you have seen that you use the knowledge of the stiffness of uh, your transmission. Uh, unfortunately, there's no way to measure the stiffness. I mean, you, for example, for safety, you can use the uh, so-called uh, safe back isochrone. So you can uh, have a soft uh, behavior when you move fast and a stiff behavior when you move slow. And, uh, but the problem is that stiffness of the transmission is intrinsically nonlinear and time varying. Uh, so often you use uh, an appro approximate model and as I said, there is no way to measure it because it is not uh, uh, just a value, but it's a differential value. And so it's very difficult to, it, I mean, there's no uh, an hardware that is able to measure it. Uh, just a little bit of story, uh, this problematics was uh, firstly uh, recognized by Professor De Luca and Professor Bicchi during a flight coming back from, uh, I think, an IRS conference or a higher ICRA conference, and they say that there is this problematics, and then the both groups start to work on uh, this field. Uh, let's say uh, some we we can say in competition, and so what you will see today are uh, uh, different strategies to estimate the stiffness, uh, mainly from uh, the University of Pisa and IIT and the University of Rome. Uh, all these methods. Uh, try to, to get the estimation using a regressor or uh, using uh, two, two, uh, two steps, where in the first step you estimate some uh, values that is related to the stiffness and then use a secondary step to uh, extract the stiffness from this estimation. So just to recall a little bit the dynamic model of a flexible transmission, probably you have seen this, uh, this equation uh, very often these days. Uh, so you have, for a flexible transmission, you have two equations, one for um, the link side, so you have the um, link uh, inertia, link damping. We have the flexibility torque, and the gravity, and some external torques. Uh, and then this is related to the motor through the flexible transmission. So in the motor side, you have the uh, motor damping, uh, the motor inertia, 
the flexible transmission and the motor torques. So as you can see, you can move the motor to, uh, you can move the link to uh, moving the motor to the flexible transmission. Uh, the flexible transmission usually has this uh, special property, so practically it's zero when the transmission is, is uh, not deformed, and the behavior in the extension and in the compression is usually um, symmetric. So if you take the, if you deform, if you compress in one quantity, you get the same uh, stiffness, the same torque that if you uh, extend in the, with the same quantity. And the stiffness, as you probably know now, is uh, defined as the variation of the flexibility torque with respect to the variation of the deformation of the, of the transmission. So uh, in the slides, very often you will see the, as an uh, illustrative example for the simulation, you will see the variable stiffness actuator in an antagonistic uh, configuration. So we, you have two motors that moves uh, the link to two transmission. They are um, connected in an antagonistic uh, configuration so you have two equations for the motors that moves the, uh, the links, and clearly the, um, the total torques that moves the links is given by the sum of the two uh, flexible torques, and the stiffness in the same way is defined as the sum of the two stiffness. This property will be uh, used in the, later in the estimation. So the, uh, in particular, we will see um, as uh, illustrative examples, the VSA2 developed by the, the University of Pisa in 2008. Uh, so the uh, VSA2 is composed by, is an antagonistic uh, arrangement of two motors, and then there is uh, a flexible transmission that is composed by a nonlinear, so it's a nonlinear flexible transmission that is composed of four bar linkage and a linear spring. In particular, this is the schematic of the transmission. You have this uh, uh, four bar linkage and a linear spring, which is, uh, and the model of this transmission is given by this equation. So we have this two, two lengths, hal, and uh, uh, then we have the, the stiffness of the springs K, which give the potential energy by differentiating the potential energy. You get uh, the torque, which have this form, and by differentiating the torque you have uh, with respect to the deformation, you have the stiffness that has this, uh, this form. So as I said, you can uh, consider phi as the deformation of the transmission, which is actually just the difference between uh, the motor position and the link position for both motors. And um, you have so the, the flexibility torque that's given by the sum of the two flexibility torque, the total stiffness, the sum of the two total stiffness. And at the end, you get this uh, a dynamic equation for the world of motor. You can see here that you have also, you can also consider the gravity and the uh, external torques that are something that can uh, be, that can uh, change the behavior of your stiffness estimator. So what, what is the classical way to uh, estimate the stiffness or to have a measure of the stiffness? Practically, it's a model based. So you have the model of your, of your transmission. You can measure directly uh, the length of the uh, four uh, bar linkage, mainly these two lengths, so R and L. You can um, estimate the stiffness of your uh, linear spring. You can use the data sheets of the spring, or you can have an uh, initial estimation. And so then you use the the model of your spring and said, okay, this is the stiffness of my, um, of my uh, actuator. Actually, this is not completely true because, because clearly there are, your, uh, your model is subject of kinematic and, demand and dynamic uncertainty. Okay, maybe you are able to measure uh, very well uh, these two lengths, but for the stiffness of the spring is not so, um, so true because clearly uh, it's difficult to have an, uh, an exact estimation of the stiffness of the spring. Then you are considering the spring linear, but maybe it's not linear in, uh, for all the extension. Maybe it will change its behavior when you elongate it a lot. Uh, then there are also other, other dynamic 
uncertainty that you have not considered in your model. There are friction, there are uh, so many different problematics that you didn't consider. <coughs> so at the end, your stiffness estimation, your measure given by the model is not completely accurate. So the idea is then to uh, try to estimate the stiffness by estimating some values. Uh, the first work uh, that has been published on this, uh, on this field is by uh, George Giogrioli and uh, Antonio Bicchi that was published in RS RSS in 2010. And the idea is to start from the uh, mechanical impedance, so the stiffness, uh, using the, a linear system, so the X-Law. So you have a, a, a spring that has some stiffness K, and you are compressing it with a force F, and you are looking to the deformation. In this case, we uh, represent it with Y. So you can generalize it with, with a nonlinear uh, system. So you have the deformation with that is related to some function, nonlinear function of the deformation, and so you get the stiffness as, so practically this function is the flexibility torque, and you get the estimation of this, you get the stiffness as the variation of this flexibility torque with respect to the deformation. So we can generalize uh, again this model by considering the impedance, so we consider uh, a mass, uh, a spring, and also a damping factor. And then we get this uh, second harder uh, equation. So we want to estimate, in this case, we want to estimate the impedance of, uh, of the joint. So the idea that was proposed in this work is uh, that we start from um, this dynamic equation. So it's practically a representation of flexible transmission. We have a torque that actually is uh, the torque that's given by the motor. We have some mass and um, and damping that is given by uh, your motor. Uh, we, you have some um, flexible transmission. In this case, to be more general as possible, they considered uh, to have both the deformation Y, but also a control U that can change the behavior, your stiffness, of uh, the stiffness of the transmission. And then you have this, uh, as output, you have uh, the flexibility torques, so the torques that come out from the, your transmission. So by differentiating this equation, you get this other equation. So you, you see here the third derivative of the deformation, and also this relation, which is practically the, uh, the time derivative of the flexibility torque is given by the stiffness times the uh, first derivative of the deformation of the joint, of the transmission. So you can build an estimate of these values, uh, and uh, by using this uh, two relation, you get at the end an estimation of the stiffness. Actually, you get an estimation of the stiffness time uh, y dot. So uh, they propose to use uh, an reg a regression, a stiffness of by using this law. So practically, they, uh, they update the stiffness estimation dot, so the first derivative of the, first, the stiffness estimation by using this this equation, so you see here, alpha is just uh, a scalar value, it's a gain. The estimation of the measure of the torque dot, so practically they have to use a torque sensor to get uh, the torque and then they have to derivate this torque. And they use this function, which is a, a simple sine function, which is zero when y dot is zero and you get, just get uh, positive values, so it's minus uh, y dot when it's uh, negative and y dot when it's positive. And they proved that uh, it has a convergence within a uh, uniformly you know, arterially bounded error region near to, to this, uh, this region. So they are able to estimate the stiffness. So they proposed some, um, so as I said, one of the problematics of this, uh, of this method is that you need to derivate the, uh, the torque that comes from a sensor which is uh, which can give you some problem, but you can solve it clear, clearly. Then if you look to the uh, stiffness estimation, so here there is the position and the speed of the transmission, and here you can see the estimation of the stiffness. You see these points that the estimation, the estimation is not updated when this, the position or the velocity is zero. In fact, you can see here from this equation, when the sign is zero, you are not updating your estimation. And you have this, uh, let's say, this black hole in this part. The good point of this uh, uh, estimation method is it, 
is that uh, it is not parametric, so you have not tuned anything. It's just uh, a gain alpha. It's model free, so you are not considering a special model for your transmission uh, to estimate the stiffness, but you can use whatever you want. Uh, in some cases, you can accumulate. You can use some accumulated knowledge to fill this gap. This is practically what, what they uh, presented in uh, another work, which was actually in Accra 2011, where practically uh, they tried to project their uh, regressor on a function basis. So practically, they start from uh, the flexibility torque equation. They just change the, uh, just consider just a vector hex that consider y and u, and then use uh, a Taylor series or a polynomial function fitting that is linear to the parameter c, plus a residual because the polynomial is trunked to the n terms. Then you can write it in this form. Now, uh, if you derivate this basis in this way, so you take the derivation of this basis with respect to x, so practically you are computing the derivation of the flexibility torque with respect to the, the uh, deformation, so you get exactly the stiffness. And they call this uh, matrix S. At the end, they change the update law in this way. So practically, the update of the parameter C are uh, guided are by the pseudo inversion of uh, the matrix S then we have this matrix A, which is a matrix with positive gain values. Uh, we see, uh, again, the, the same function. By differentiating this, you get this, uh, this final equation that gives you an estimation of the stiffness. Actually, the idea is practically that before, you, they used a non-parametric stiffness estimator, so they used the differentiated, attempting differentiation of the uh, torque of the motor and the time differentiation of um, the deformation to get the estimation of the stiffness. Now they add some more knowledge, so they add also the uh, values of the deformation and also the control that you use, and this allows practically to improve the behavior in uh, to fill the gaps. You can see in this part that you have a, um, a better tracking of the real stiffness and you are able really to fill these gaps. They uh, have also some experimental results on uh, using this method. They use this uh, particular uh, setup where uh, there is an antagonistic uh, arrangement, but here there are some exponential springs. As you have seen probably in many lessons, the transmission has to be nonlinear in order to have the possibility to change this, the stiffness. So in this case, uh, they have used two exponential spring, and they report some uh, uh, experimental result for the estimation of the stiffness. Here it's very noisy because clearly uh, it's there are uh, real values, but you can see that both methods, the parametric and non-parametric observer, are able to track the, the stiffness and. Uh, by looking to the error, you will see that the parametric observer has uh, better results because when the velocity is zero, it's able to continue to track the, the estimation. In uh, Hiker 2011, the work of Sergio et al., uh, also with Grioli and Bicchi, uh, they presented another observer <coughs> where practically they tried to combine the stiffness observer with the, uh, an extended Kalman filter Sorry. In order to estimate not only the stiffness, but also the link inertia, the link damping, and the link stiffness. And they solved this problem by integrating, as I said, the observer with the extended Kalman filter method. And also they exploit a clever placement of the torque sensor in order to avoid the interaction of the estimation dynamics. So they have seen that if you just use a normal placement, uh, you get an algebraic loop, so you are not able to estimate the stiffness in a good way. Why, with their techniques, you can do that? Uh, clearly, uh, there are uh, good. Uh, there are the some uh, cons. Uh, practically, you cannot apply this in all kind of VSA because you are considering to to put the uh, measure of this of the tor flexibility torque in, in a special point, and uh, you it requires some knowledge of the modern model. 
but you are able to reconstruct the wall impedance of the, also in the link side. So then there are uh, presented the different approaches that uses um, a completely different idea. Uh, this was presented in our work in ICLAN in 2011. Practically, um, they consider that you always have a measure of the model position, just because you have uh, to control the robot, and the only way to control the robot, you have to have this kind of joint, you have to have a measure of the position at the motor side, also the measure of the link position. So you always have this characteristic. You can obtain the, the velocity using a numerical differentiation or filtering. You can consider uh, to have or not have uh, torque sensing. We decide to not have it, but try to estimate the stiffness without any uh, torque sensor. You can assume or not to have some dynamic parameter, and in our work, we assume it to have uh, some knowledge of the motor parameters of the inertia and the damping of the motor. Uh, then uh, you, you can estimate in two different ways. In the previous works, uh, we have seen you are estimating the link stiffness. Uh, this is a say, non-invasive approach and can have some uh, desiderable uh, aspects, but we decide to work in the, at the motor side. So we estimate the stiffness of each single transmission and then we uh, combine uh, the, the two estimations. So coming back to, the, uh, to our uh, dynamic equation of a single transmission, so practically we present a two-stage approach. So we use, as I said, uh, the knowledge of some parameter of the motor, so uh, practically the motor inertia, the motor damping, and the command the torque to obtain um, an estimation of the flexibility torque. So we, instead of using an external uh, a torque sensor, we try to estimate this by using a residual base estimation. You've seen in a previous lesson, Professor De Luca, how to use a residual base estimator to estimate the external torques. This is practically the same approach, but we are trying to estimate the flexibility torque at the link side. And then uh, uh, we have a second stage where we try to, in this work, we presented two estimator, a model-based estimator and a black box estimator that try to extract from this information the, an information about the stiffness. So, second. firstly, let's as, uh, introduce our first-order residual, which is quite similar to the residual that you have seen for the collision detection, but it's composed, in this case, by the uh, inertia matrix times uh, the uh, first derivative of the motor position plus the inertia, the damping plus theta, and then you see here these other terms where tau is the commanded torque and the residual itself. So let's go a little bit with the computation. It's very simple because practically you compute the first time derivative of this equation. You get here the BQ theta double dot also the derivative of this part, and then you just take the derivative of this integral to, so practically just you extrapolate this uh, two information. So now you use the model of your, your uh, motor side, which is, as I recall, this one. So you just compute B double dot, and you can see that very simple, that is uh, uh, minus uh, D uh, theta dot plus uh, the flexibility torque plus the common the torque plus the other part that was already here. So you just have the simplification of these two terms. The simplification of these two terms is very simple to check that at the end you get this equation. So it's very simple to prove that this is a first order filter. Also, if you look to the, um, in the Laplace domain, it's a first order filter, a low pass filter of uh, the flexibility torque. So practically by using by computing this, uh, these values, at the end you get an estimation of uh, the flexibility torque. And where k, yet yeah, this k, uh, we just put uh, tau he just to, uh, to differentiate with the other k in the, in the works, is just the bandwidth of your low pass filter. So you can set k by considering that if you take a very high k, 
uh, you have a very uh, fast behavior, your estimation, but you get all the noise in the high frequencies. He said if you take a small K, you uh, are able to filter all the uh, noise at the high frequencies, but clearly the, uh, the behavior, the transient of your uh, estimation is much more uh, slower. <laughs> so in this picture you can see the, uh, an estimation example, an esti estimation of the flexible torque of a joint with cast stiffness. So you can also, we present also a different um, discrete time implementation of this uh, residual uh, estimation. So practically here we just use the testing uh, differential method to go from the continuous time to the discrete time. And then you get this, uh, this equation. But I want to stress on the fact that why this is very useful. First of all, it's not influenced by the gravity and external force. So we are working on the motor side. We are able to estimate the, the flexibility torque, but uh, this flexibility torque can be uh, estimated without ha having any knowledge about what happened at the link side. So we have not, no uh, need to have any information about the link, damp the inertia of the link, the damping of the link, if there is some, if it's in some particular position, so we are, so we don't have to consider the gravity, or uh, if there is some contact, we don't have to consider external torques or whatever you want. Even if you try to use this, uh, uh, this estimator and combine different motors in a chain, like a climatic chain, so you have different models, we are not interested in what is behind your model because we don't, we don't have any need of information about what happened at the link side. So you can think to implement this estimator directly in the firmware of your uh, joint. The other uh, particularity is that the only uh, information you need is the parameter of the motor that in general can be obtained from the data sheets of the motor. You will see at the end also a method that allows you to uh, remove this, uh, this constraint. We don't need any uh, torque sensor. Uh, this can be considered in two ways. Okay, most often this kind of joints, so variable stiffness actuators, have a torque sensing for control uh, purpose. And so you can think, okay, you, if you have it, you can use it, sure. You can use it, you can try to, to say, okay, I have an, this information, I can combine the two information, so the, the residual base information with the with the, the sensing, or you can think that, let's go some equation back, that if you have a motor uh, torque sensing, you can start directly from the second stage. Say, okay, I, I don't need to estimate the, the torque, I can start from this other point. Another, uh, so as I said, you can start from this point. Let's go ahead. So the, the, for the second part, we said, okay, we have in general, as I said, that the torque function, which is a function of the flexibility torque, and uh, we can estimate the stiffness in this way. In particular, for the VSA2, we have these two relations. You can see here as parameter, you have the C, which is just now uh, R uh, um, over L, and the stiffness of your joint. So you can think to have a polynomial function linear in the parameter. So you have the parameter alpha. You take the, some polynomial function, and so you want to fit the behavior of uh, your flexibility torque on uh, some polynomial function. So if you, for example, take as a polynomial function, as basis for your polynomial function, this equation, here you will see just hot power of uh, the flexibility stiffness, because as I said, uh, most often the behavior of, uh, of a flexibility transmission is that you have no deformation <coughs> when there is no, you have no flexibility arc when there is no deformation and the behavior in the station and compression is exactly the same. So you can think to use only at power of uh, your basis. And then you get the, flex <coughs> the estimation of the stiffness simply by differentiating this, um, uh, this basis. You can see that this uh, differentiation can be done uh, very easily. Uh, due to the, the characteristic of this um, basis. 
And then once you have estimated practically the, the alpha value, you get the, directly the stiffness from this, uh, this other basis. So the first idea was uh, to consider some sampling. So you take a sam sample point com uh, composed by the uh, deformation of your transmission and the flexibility torque, or better in this case, the estimation of the flexibility torque given uh, by the residual, and then try to estimate the, par the parameter using a least square method. So very easily you compute the error of your estimation, so the error between the, flex the estimated flexibility torque and your um, fitting, and then you have some uh, Jacobian that's given by the, um, the partial differentiation between the, the, this polynomial function and the various parameters, and then you practically you combine the Jacobian for all your, uh, your samples and also the, the error for all your sample, and by using g simple uh, set inversion technique, you can obtain um, an update of your estimation. So practically, what we propose is to uh, take some uh, bunch of, uh, of samples and try to Im improve the estimation by considering also some new data. In particular, in particular we propose an offline method that uh, start for, with a polynomial of the first degree, then uh, compute also the estimation with a polynomial, a fitting polynomial of the second degree, uh, then we estimate the parameter with using a least square method, and we check the estimation error, so the difference between, um, the square difference between uh, the flexibility torque estimated with the residual and our uh, point fitting, and uh, by considering the error with the previous, so the first, with using a polynomial of the first order, the second error order, we decide if the estimation was good or if we need to improve, to increase the, the polynomial, how our, uh, the degree of our polynomial function. <coughs> At the end, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> so we, we propose some uh, numerical results um, practically, we initially we considered a constant stiffness with the stiffness k. You can see by using this method, you get clearly you stop with the polynomial of the fifth order, and you get practically exactly the estimation of your stiffness. Then we consider a nonlinear stiffness do, uh, given by or nonlinear uh, flexibility torque to a, a cubic equation. And also in this case, you will see that the stiffness estimator stops with a polynomial two clearly because it's exactly what you need. And also the, the estimation of the two stiffness of the two parameters, k, a, k, b, are um, perfect. Then we consider also the VSA2, and in this case the polynomial uh, stops with the fifth order. And if we look um, to um, how the polynomial function uh, fits on, uh, on the real or on the simulated uh, stiffness of this joint, you can see that you have a very good behavior in the region where you, you use the, the joint. Clearly, you, you cannot have a very good estimation in the region where you never use the joint. Uh, this is clearly for, uh, for the estimation uh, behavior. The second uh, method proposed was uh, by using a second harder residual. So in this case, we designed this other residual here, P is just <coughs> the generalized momentum at the mother side, so just be uh, theta dot as before. And without going too, too slowly, we just have, <coughs> you can just check that uh, we take the fifth derivative of this uh, quantity. As before, here, P dot is just uh, B theta double dot you can use the dynamic model of your mother side, <coughs> and you check just that this part, all this part is just the flexibility torque as before. Then you go to the second order, so you differentiate again the residual, and you get this equation. This is just a, first, a second order filter <coughs> of uh, this other quantity, which is the time derivative of the flexibility torque, which is, as we have seen before, is given by the stiffness times uh, the first order the time derivative of the deformation. So the idea is that, okay, we are able to estimate 
these values, and then you can see, okay, we, I can get an estimation of the stiffness just by uh, taking our residual uh, um, over the, these uh, values. Clearly, when uh, th this velocity of the deformation is near, is close to zero, or exactly zero, this uh, division is not well defined, <clears throat> then you are not able to estimate anything. So we propose to use uh, this special kind of regressor. So we update our stiffness estimation by using this equation. So you can see here we have our uh, residual times the deformation, the de first time derivative of the deformation, and here use again our stiffness estimation. So for what we said, the residual is exactly uh, this part, so uh, the stiffness, the first time derivative of the deformation, then we combine these two parts, we can extrapolate or we can approximate on this, uh, with this approximation, and then we can uh, extrapolate this part, and we check that uh, this quantity is stable, so converge to the real stiffness, if uh, uh, this other quantity is less than one. So practically if this gain is uh, within um, zero and two. Uh, clearly, we, ha we can set here KEP, but we have no direct control on uh, the variation, or better, if you want to say the more general possible, say, okay, we are not controlling it, but we are just measuring it. Uh, we cannot ensure that this value is inside this region. So what we can do is to set a Kmax and uh, try to compute KP to change KP online in order to stay within this, uh, this bound. So the first example that we propose is uh, an estimation of a constant stiffness. You can see here that when this proportional factor goes uh, over uh, this value, which is just our limits, the estimation becomes instable. So you, have, <laughs> you are not estimating anything here. Instead, by using uh, the stability recover, so by using this limitation, uh, you get a very good estimation of this cost of stiffness. Then we consider also the cubic polynomial, and also in this case, you can see that you have a first transient phase where uh, practically the, uh, the regressor is starting to uh, compute the estimation, and then after this first transient, you get a very good estimation of the stiffness of the joint. So you will see uh, the transient is about one second. And also, if we consider the VSA2, the, uh, the model of the VSA2, uh, you can see that after transient, you can, we are able to estimate the stiffness of both motors, and also clearly, the total stiffness, which is just given by the sum of the two stiffness, is very good tracked. So, sorry, one moment. After that, in the work in uh, HIFAC 2011, we uh, tried to use a different approach. Okay, use exactly the same residual-based method to estimate the flexibility torque, but to uh, change the second uh, part using a recursive square method. So the idea is that we want to estimate the stiffness online. We want to use a polynomial fitting as we did uh, before, but we want to do this offline, but we want to, in we want to update the estimation online. So uh, exactly as before, we consider some polynomial basis, also in this case we use only odd power because uh, of the uh, assumption that we did on the flexibility, uh, of the flexibility arc behavior, and then we can, use, we can compute the stiffness simply by uh, uh, using this derivative of the basis. So we just need to estimate these alpha values. The idea is that if we want to obtain an estimation, so we want to minimize the square error, so the error, square error between uh, our measured or our estimated flexibility torque, so our residual, and the fitting polynomial, as we said before, we have to use um, upset inversion. So practically, we have to compute this half matrix which composed for example, in, for our polynomial basis, is composed by these uh, terms. So for each uh, sample, you compute uh, this uh, f function, and you're trying to estimate the 
you are trying to use this uh, equation to estimate the values of alpha. The problem is that the dimension half is equal to the number of uh, samples. So if you try to use this technique online, you will reach a point that you will have so many rows in your f, uh, f matrix that doing this inverse, doing this pseudo inversion, but doing this inversion is impossible online. Uh, actually, this is called usually the uh, com um, the covariance matrix of your estimation. So you are trying to do this pseudo inversion, this inversion, uh, but the, you have a number of rows so big that doing it online is impossible. So the idea is <coughs> to use a recursively square method. Uh, so just let me uh, collect this data in uh, this matrix uh, gamma and lambda, just for simplicity. So as we said, the estimation of the stiffness is given by inverting the covariance matrix times these other parts, this lambda. So the idea is, okay, I want to compute this estimation by using the information that I already have in the previous step, so by using this other equation. So I'm supposed to have this equation, to have this uh, estimation, and to use this estimation to estimate the new, the new estimation with a new sample. So the first thing that we have to do is to rewrite our lambda, lambda and, um, and gamma in, as a function of the previous step. This is very simple due to the, the form. So here we have just a sum of this part, the sum of this part. It's very easy to, to check that you can compute the update of the gamma and lambda uh, matrices in this way. So at this point, uh, you have to use the matrix inversion formula. This says that if you have two matrices A and B, uh, where uh, M times M positive definitive, and a matrix B, N uh, times N matrix, and at matrix C, M times N, that are related with this equation. So A is equal to the inversion of B plus C, the inversion of D, uh, C transpose. Then you can compute the inversion of the matrix A using this other equation. This is a well-known uh, relation. And so if you consider our covariance matrix, so our uh, gamma, you can see that this relation is exactly equal to this one. So you can think that uh, B, uh, the inversion of B is exactly the previous uh, values of gamma, then C is equal to half, so you have F, F transpose, and this simple, the identity matrix. By using this relation, you get at the end this very big, the big relation, but you can see that you can update the inversion of, of your covariance matrix. Uh, you can update it directly by the knowledge of the inversion of the covariant matrix in the previous step by using this relation. Then uh, we denote the inversion of the covariance matrix using the, the symbol P. So P is now the inversion of the covariance matrix. We can uh, uh, use this uh, HAL, which is actually a uh, Kalman gain uh, given by this relation. As with a little bit of math, of math, I will not present it here because it's a little bit too, uh, there's no time to, to do that, but it can be proven that this hell is equal to uh, the, in, the inverse of the covariance matrix time half. So uh, by combining all these uh, ingredients, is, you can uh, set, you can see that you can update the inversion of the covariance matrix, so you can update P simply by using this relation. Uh, this is very important to see that you are updating the inversion of the covariance matrix without using any inversion. So in this equation, you are not using any inversion. This is one of the principal benefits of the recursive square. So you are updating, practically, you are updating your set inversion, but you are not inverting anything. Uh, this is gives you a very, a very robust and stable estimation uh, characteristic. So now we want to uh, der derive the main time update equation, so you want to update our stiffness estimation, we are going through all this math. It's not so complicated. So we start with this relation, so with this, time dif with this update law, also with this law. So as I said, uh, the inversion of the, um, of the covariance matrix is uh, just indicated with P. So you can see 
um, that, as I say, we said before, that the new sample of the gamma matrix can be obtained from the previous sample in this way. Then you can see, also see that the gamma matrix at, at the previous step is related to the alpha matrix at the previous step and, uh, and the gamma matrix at the previous step using this relation. So practically you're just using this relation but you're inverting this relation so you get this other part. Then going ahead, uh, you can uh, obtain, use also the relation between the previous step of the gamma matrix and the current step of the gamma matrix also by using the, the update law that we have seen before. Then at this point, you can see that the P matrix time, the gamma matrix is the identity because we say that the P matrix is the inversion of the gamma matrix. So you can extrapolate the previous sample here and then you have all the other parts of P times F, F transpose, uh, the parameter in the previous step times P, F and the residual. So we can go ahead, we can uh, collect P, F and practically at the end, we have this update uh, law. As I said before, P and F can be proven that is equal to HAL, which is actually uh, the Kalman gain of our estimation. And so the estimation of the new step of, the stiff, of these parameters that compose the, um, the polynomial fitting is given by the previous step, this uh, Kalman, uh, Kalman gain, and the error at the previous step. So to combine everything, we can get uh, the, the parameter vector to minimize the discussed function using the recursive least square formula. So practically, we, uh, we update at each step. So each step, we have a new sample. We update the estimation of the alpha values by using this Kalman factor, considering the error in the fitting of the previous, uh, using the previous fitting function. By using this Kalman gain and by updating this P matrix, so the inverse of the covariance matrix, by simple, simple using this formula. This practically gives exactly uh, the result of least square uh, approach, but instead of uh, collecting all the data and then using a classical least square approach, you are updating your least square estimation uh, at uh, each time you have a new sample. This gives a very good um, online characteristic because as I said in all, uh, this computation, you don't have to invert anything. It's just very simple computation, and it's very fast. Uh, we propose in this work also a method to uh, recover the error of the residual, so simple by see that the, if you look to the difference between the real flexibility torque and your estimation use the residual, you get this error which is related to this uh, Uh, what do you mean with constraints? Uh, because as I remember for the standard common filter, you cannot involve constraints. You cannot deal with the constraints. You mean if you want to put uh, maximum minimum values for uh, stiffness? Actually, I never uh, tried to do that. I don't know if in the literature is, there is some method uh, to perform these things. But my question is, is there a need for something like that? Uh, there's no need. I mean, what you will see uh, later in another slide, in other work, is that we use uh, a method to improve the robustness with respect to uh, persistent excitation. So if you have no persistent excitation, clearly you are not able, this is a least square method. So if you are not exciting what you, what you want to estimate, you are not getting nothing from the estimation. Putting some limitation, I never told this, but uh, practically what you are doing is uh, upset inversion. So maybe you can uh, put the, the constraints uh, in the process just by transforming these constraints in, um, uh, in, in other field you will see in a bilateral constraint so you have a constraint, so you have a unilateral constraint, then you can get an equation from this constraint that you have to activate only when you need, and then you can try to put it in the upset inversion estimation, and it try to 
take it into account, but I've never tried to do that. I don't know if there is some literature about that. Yeah, there's no, I mean, we never uh, had problem with it. Okay, to go ahead, practically, uh, you can use, as I was saying, uh, you can uh, try to get a relation between, of the error of your estimation with the residual. Then you can to, to use, um, to estimate this by considering a backward differentiation of two sample or just to use the, an approximate relation between the time differentiation of the residual and the torques, which is given as, again, is given by the stiffness time, the first order the time derivative of the deformation. And then you can you try to use this, um, we call the rare, so residual error recovery. You can try to put this uh, recovery in the, uh, square in the recursive least square estimation, so in this step, so just practically you are just considering to use uh, another term summed to the residual. So by looking at some uh, si simulation, also in this case we consider a VSA2 actuator. Uh, these uh, are the plot of the deformation of the two transmission. And these are the estimation of the flexibility torque using the residual. It's in this case quite a good uh, estimation. And then these are the results of the stiffness estimation of the of let's say of the curve fitting uh, using our recursively square method. You can see here that, that after a very, very slow transient, maybe you cannot see here, but it's, it's 10 seconds, so the, the transient phase is, is uh, less than a uh, few milliseconds. It's, uh, it was around, I think, 10 milliseconds. And then over time, you can see also how the um, the profile of the stiffness changes over time. So in, uh, you can see in 0 0.5 seconds, the, the final estimation of the profile is obtained. Clearly, this is an online method and change during the, um, the estimation. So it's, it's um, realized in a way that if, for example, now you're using your robot in this region, you're joining this region. Then if you go in another region, you are able to start to consider also the other sample and start to change the behavior of your, uh, uh, your estimation. There is another point that I didn't present here, but it's what is called forgetting factor in the recursive least square. So you can put the parameter in order that new sample have a, a more weight with respect to whole samples. So this gives you a better um, capability of change the behavior of your fitting polynomial during time. So it's uh, more uh, reactive to variation. Also, we just showed that without the rare scheme, um, the estimation is not so, so good as uh, before. And also, if another point, if you use a polynomial function, which is with a true low degree to catch the the behavior of the transmission, you're not getting a good uh, estimation because the, um, the polynomial function, the fitting function is trying to, to accommodate with uh, the other uh, part, but it's not a function that's, that's going to fit on the real function. In this case, uh, you get very big error. So it's very important to take a uh, polynomial degree which is I don't say that fits with the, the joint that you want to use, but it should be larger enough. So uh, we go ahead with this uh, presentation in August 2011. We tried to use this method also for a uh, joint with uh, adjustable stiffness. Uh, probably you have seen this also during the presentations. It's slight, slight different to the antagonistic arrangement. Here you have a motor that moves the link and a secondary motor that changes the behavior of the, of the transmission. So practically, you have an equation as before for the link side. You have an equation for the motor, the principal motor that moves the, the link and an equation for the secondary motor that changes the behavior. The particularity of this um, approach is that the flexibility torque is a function of the deformation of the, of the transmission, but also of the, set, uh, the setting point of the secondary motor. 
And in the same way, we can uh, have some relation of the flexibility torque and the, of the stiffness by considering the same relation that we have seen before. Uh, for the residual base estimator, here we have to change a little bit the things. As I said, we have a relation for the flexibility torque that comes from two uh, sources. We have the set point of the secondary motor and uh, the deformation of the, of the transmission. So uh, we can use two polynomials, one for uh, the secondary motor, one for the transmission. Uh, for the transmission, we can use also, in this case, the odd power of the, of the transmission because we have the same, uh, we, we assume the same uh, behavior. Uh, for the um, secondary model, we just have another relation, just another polynomial. In this case, we take all the, uh, the degree till uh, m minus one. The, the important thing is that when you put all this together, you can see that at the end, we are not interested in alpha and beta, which are the parameter of these two functions, but we are just interested in eta, that are the product of these two. So practically, at the end, we have a different polynomial function to estimate where we, have, we want to estimate the parameter eta. And since then, we can compute the stiffness in this way. You can see here we have the estimated eta. So we are not interested on, on uh, have a disjoint estimation of alpha and beta, but we just need to estimate uh, eta. And this gives us the possibility to, to proceed with the same, uh, with the same, in the same way. So practically, uh, this is exactly what we, we, I have shown you before, so the, the discrete time implementation of uh, the residual. At this point, we uh, take into consideration other problematics. Uh, one problematic is that uh, the, um, the information about the position of the motors and of the link comes from some sensor, usually encoder. So you have a noise. A noise for the encoder, clearly the encoder has not a uh, Gaussian noise as you can think for, uh, for example, a potentiometer, but has a noise that comes from the quantization and the, discretiz the discretization of the signal. It is it's important in the moment that you want, we want to have an estimation of the velocity of the motor. <coughs> Uh, to, to deal with these problematics, we presented a modified kinematic Kalman filter. So practically, it is a kinematic Kalman filter. So the state is given by the position and the velocity of the motor. You have um, an evolution of the state, which clearly uh, considers that you move with constant velocity. And then uh, you have a process noise covariance that is uh, related to the fact that actually you're not moving to constant velocity. So the variance of the process is given the, by the fact that uh, you're not considering the acceleration of, uh, your pro in, in, within your process. But then for the input noise variance, we consider a variable input noise that is a function of the velocity. This because because when you have an encoder, if you... Um, if you move fast, if uh, your motor is uh, going at high velocities, the fact that you have a quantization and discretization is not so important. So you get very, very often a new sample, so you can use actually just a time differentiation. But when you move slow, you get, always, you get for some, many steps the same quantization level. At the end, your noise, your impulse noise is higher because you're not changing the level. And this is practically is coded on this equation. So for the input noise variance, we are considering that if you go slow, your variance of your input is higher. If you go fast, it's lower. Another problem that uh, we have to deal with, as I was saying before, is the problem of persistent excitation. Uh, we want to guarantee that our uh, estimation converges also when uh, you are not, uh, excit uh, the excitation of uh, your estimator is not perfect. To do that, we uh, modified the recursively squared algorithm by adding just this uh, A uh, scalar values in these two points, so in the update of the parameter estimation in the update of um, the uh, inverse of the covariance matrix. And it's a very good uh, work of Bittany et al. in the 90s. They proved that the recursively square converges if uh, this um, uh, relation is met. 
And so practically we just uh, use a reverse en engineer, so we just use this relation to, uh, to force the, co the convergence of our uh, method by using this stability factor. So we set some uh, C values that we want arbitrarily, and then we change A in order to map this, uh, this relation. Uh, for the experiment here, we use uh, the Hawas, which is uh, uh, an actuator with adjustable stiffener from HIT. It's slightly like different between uh, the antagonistic uh, arrangement. Here, practically, there is a, a motor that changes the lever of, uh, that, of the arm, and then by changing this position, uh, the behavior of the transmission at this point changes because they have a different, uh, different lever. Um, we compared in this work also uh, different estimation. As I said, for the as input of the second stage of the recursive d square method, you can use different information. So we try to compare a model uh, estimation. So by using as input of the recursive d square, the, fle the flexibility torque that comes from the model. A sensor, so the flexibility torque that comes from a torque sensor mounted on the joint and the residual that estimates the, actually the, the flexibility torque. To have a numerical comparison, we uh, introduced two index, the mean square error, so practically we just take the square error between, the sum of the square error between the, two is the real stiffness, the estimated stiffness over the sample, and mean square relative error percentage that just uh, use a relative error inside the, the product just because we want to, with this other index, we want to see uh, how big is that error with respect to the set point that we have at that moment. So we uh, control the hours joined with these two talks, these talks for the first motor, the principal motor, and these talks for the secondary motor, and we have this deformation. You can see here that the deformation is very small in the order of 10 minus three. Why this deformation is very small with respect to the antagonistic case? Uh, this because uh, since the uh, stiffness variation is given by the, sec the secondary motor, there's no need to have a very big deformation to get a uh, uh, high variation of the flexibility torque. So at the end, with this kind of job, you, you get a very small variation. This is the, po the, the problems that you have for the persistent of excitation. Another thing that we want to show is that using our uh, modified kinematic Kalman filter, we are, we are able to get a very good estimation of the velocity of the motor, while if you use just uh, uh, discrete time differentiation, you get this very uh, moving, very noisy estimation, but this is clear. And also here we show the estimation of the flexibility torque using the residual, which we start with this uh, red heap put, so this very noisy input, and we get a very good estimation of the flexibility torque. At the end, we uh, get these estimations of the residual, of the stiffness. You can see that uh, the, in red you see the actual stiffness. You can see that the residual stiffness, or better, the sensor stiffness is practically perfect as uh, the model stiffness, which clearly comes from the true values. While uh, the residual is also good, it's not as good as um, the, res the sensor method, but it's quite good for uh, its characteristic. You can see also this property by, use by looking to the mean square, mean square error and the mean square relative error percentage. At this point, uh, we want just to focus on the stability factor and to see that when uh, the deformation, the velocity of the deformation comes near to zero, you can see here the uh, behavior of our stability factor A. This plot is uh, in a semi-logarithmic scale, so you can see this, uh, these values are very uh, deep. And the behavior is that when you are near to this uh, region where the, uh, the persistent excitation is not met, you just have this stability factor that reduces the we can say the, uh, the speed of our estimation, and this gives us the possibility not to be uh, uh, corrupted by uh, these wrong values. 
For example, if you try to use a constant um, stability factor, so we, you put a constant A, you get two different behaviors. If it, if it is, um, it should be, if it, you take a um, value that is too small, you have a very slow convergence and you are not able to track the real stiffness. Instead, if you take a value which is too high, you have a very, you are very sensitive to poor excitation, so you get this discontinuities around this uh, point where you have the poor excitation. Then we uh, compared also some experiments, and um, in the experiments, also in this case, you can see we have many uh, situations of poor excitation. This is the, the plot of the lever arm, so the set point of the secondary motor, and this is the flexibility torque uh, that comes uh, from the model and the torque sensor. You can see here that they are near, so the, uh, the torque the flexibility task that comes from the sensor is near to the model, but actually they are not, they are not the same. And this can be uh, seen in the, our estimation. So the, here in the first part here below this, so in, the, um, in this plot you can see the nominal stiffness and the one estimated with the model. So the nominal stiffness and the one that comes by using the nominal flexibility torque for the, as input of the recursivity square are perfectly uh, superimposed. It means that the residual, the recursivity square is able exactly to estimate it. But actually, the, the stiffness estimation obtained with the sensor by using the torque sensor is different. This means that uh, the model that was used, it was not able to catch the behavior of the, um, of the stiffness. So what you have here is that um, if you use as input the, the sensed values, which having uh, tuned the torque sensor we believe to be uh, the true values, you get a different estimation of the stiffness, stiffness, different stiffness. And the good thing is that our residual method is able to give exactly the same stiffness so after a transient phase where we have some noise, we get exactly the same stiffness. So we are able to uh, estimate the stiffness which was not the nominal stiffness. So if you try to use this joint with the nominal stiffness, um, I not say that you are not used to the robot because clearly when you put then in the control, a control a feedback loop with a PD, you can recover the, the hair or butts, the performance will be much lower. A different approach, a very interesting different approach was presented by Menard et al. Also in this case there is, was a, a work of uh, Giorgio Grioli and uh, Antonio Bic in, uh, together with um, Thomas Menard. It was presented in ICRA 2013. And the idea is also in this case to have a first step and a second stage, where in the second stage you use a recursive square. But in the first stage the thing to use to derive some relationship with, that involves the stiffness, then transform this relationship in, into a relationship between integral of the measured signal and then estimate the stiffness. In uh, the work in ICRA 2013, he used uh, a mathematic theory that calls operational calculus very, uh, for me, a very uh, difficult to understand, but in the true paper, uh, he changed a little bit uh, uh, the, uh, the presentation of the paper and here I'm using modelic function, and here I'm presenting uh, this second version. So first of all, he defined a uh, modulating function as uh, a function of over the k, that practically this function um, uh, psi from that within a b gives a value here, which is a k time differentiable such that the values of this differential function at the point a the point B is zero, where uh, with this uh, uh, symbol we uh, represent the height order derivative of this function. Then the second definition is that uh, if you have a function between A and B, the integral of this function between A and B can be uh, represented as the inner product of the function f and the modulating function. And then we have two propositions. 
if you had to function F1, F, F2, integrable uh, within this uh, region AB, and use a K order modeling function in a constant C, we have the following properties. Uh, the first property is very important for uh, this work. Practically, uh, it allows to replace uh, a derivative of the function which is usually unknown because, for example, if we have access only to the measured value, then you have to uh, differentiate the measured value, which is not always a very good thing to do. But you can uh, replace it with uh, the differentiation of the modality function that can, you can compute analytically since you chose the, the, uh, this function. So it is a very, very important result. So practically, you have a values. You want to differentiate these values. You take a modulating function, and instead of uh, differentiating the, the, the values, you're differentiating the modulating function that you can do analytically. Then the second property is just how to combine two functions and how to, to get uh, um, to separate and to have uh, uh, two modulating function, two, two modulating the first function and the secondary function. So it gives a uh, property for the product, product and for the sum. So the idea they presented was uh, this one. Particularly also, in this work, they consider to uh, start from the motor side. So they start to consider the, um, the dynamic model of the motor. Then uh, they consider that a first order time derivative of this equation. So we get here the third derivative. Then at this point, they um, replace the stiffness that comes here with uh, this uh, polynomial uh, fitting function by using a Taylor expansion approximation. At this point, we can uh, replace the, sti the uh, stiffness values here and get this other, this other uh, relation. You can see here we have the relation between derivatives of uh, some uh, uh, sensed quantities. At this point, we can uh, use the modulating function to both the, the side of this equation, and we can start to use the property. Okay, the first property is that, okay, the first thing is not a, it's a property of the derivatives. You can see that uh, this equation, so the first time derivative of this part is just uh, this equation, this comes from the property of the, of the derivatives, so it's very simple to check. But important of this first part is that we can uh, uh, split these parts using the second property I show you, so this property. And we can, we can separate uh, this three modulating function in this way. Then again, we can use uh, the first property. So instead of computing the first time derivative of this quantity, the third time derivative of this quantity, the second time derivative of this quantity, the first time derivative of this quantity, we can use the, the, the first property, this one, to instead compute the derivative of the uh, modulating function. So finally, we have this equation, which is uh, much sim simple to handle because we, here they are involved uh, just uh, analytical differentiation on quantity that we showed. So it's very much simple. The second step is that uh, we want to estimate the parameters alpha of uh, our uh, least square algorithm, but we want to do that online. So for this purpose, uh, we consider A and B uh, between uh, uh, T and uh, capital T and T, where the capital T is the length of the integration window that we want to consider. And then we just replace uh, this modeling function with the integrals using the first property that we have seen. So at the end, we get these integrals. And this shows in, the, in their work this modeling function. By going ahead with uh, this computation, they can use other properties. They chose at the end this modeling function. And uh, they can prove that that integral can be sorted in this way. Uh, I'm not going to deep on these details, also because they are very difficult to understand. Also for me, it's not a uh, very simple work. But uh, what you can say that at the end, they uh, want to uh, approximate all the integrals using uh, a trapezoidal method, so just a window, a trapezoidal method in, within the window. At the end, they 
uh, they reach this um, uh, this this uh, this, uh, this relation composed by the half values that we want to estimate, some C and B values that comes from these big, big equations. But in this big equation, you can see that they are involved with our modulating function for different uh, points, so W23 and 32, for which we can compute the de time derivative of this modulating function. Uh, the important thing is, is that both the matrix B and the matrix C can be obtained with a fit, uh, uh, fear filter. So even if uh, the theory is very difficult to understand, when you want to implement it, at the end it's not so complicated. Uh, within the trope paper, if you go to ITPOLY Explore, you can find also the MATLAB code. And if you look to the MATLAB code, you will see that uh, at the end the method is not so complicated to understand. And uh, the behavior is... Uh, of the estimation is very good. And uh, then uh, presented the results starting from uh, the position of the link and the position of uh, the motors and the torques and uh, the noise at the values. Okay, sorry for the quality of this uh, picture. I just took it from the, the paper because uh, it's not my work, so I just took it from the, the, the throw paper. But you can see here that the estimation of the stiffness, uh, also with the um, low degree, polynomial with low degree is quite good, also with high noise. Uh, another solution, uh, another thing I want to say on this uh, method is that we also uh, look at a lot of this method. And I think one of the good property of this method is that using a field filter, practically they have a no causal action so they are able to use also um, values that are, um, let's say, in the future. So they have some delay in the estimation. But this delay is not very important. You will see another work that we presented that under some assumption, this delay is not uh, a problem. Then I just want to, uh, to mention also this work by Sigrid Lloyd Hall in the International Conference of Advanced Intelligent Mechatronics in 2013, where they, they have a mechatronics solution. Practically, they want to use um, uh, a sensor that is based on uh, infrared. And with the sensor, they, they are able to measure the deformation of the transmission. So the, here you can see some prototype. And the idea, their idea is instead to to have some uh, relation with respect to the uh, elastic energy. So they are able to estimate using the sensor the elastic energy of the joint and then by using uh, double uh, differentiation with respect to the deformation, they are able to get the uh, transmission. And also in this case, they use a polynomial fitting with recursively square and they are able to get this alpha values and with a double uh, in differentiation, we, they are able to obtain uh, good results. So the next methods that uh, we presented uh, in NICRA NIC 2014 try to uh, solve or to cope with the problematics that uh, are in all the, the presented method. More or less is that in some works, you need to have a torque sensor, so we, we don't want to use a uh, torque sensor, and also in practically all the, the this uh, this work, you need all all, or you need uh, the parameter of the link of the link side. So you need to know the mass and the damping and other parameter of your link side, or you need the motor parameter. So you need to know the uh, the motor inertia, and motor damping. Okay, while the link side is a little bit complicated because uh, it depends on your setup. Okay, in the moment that you add uh, another joint, your behavior changes. If you have a collision, your behavior changes. If you put the, uh, the joint in a different position so you have a different gravity vector, your behavior changes. The, the motor parameters are uh, simpler to handle, but if you experience it a little bit with motors, if you take the parameters from the data sheets, not often, are uh, are quite accurate. So we try to have a different method that 
try to estimate both things, the stiffness, but also the model parameters. So the idea is practically um, to use no extra sensor except for the model link position as before, but also uh, the, without having any uh, parameter for the motor, for the link side, any extent, external source, external force sensor, sorry, uh, any um, um, assumption for the characteristic of the flexibility torque, and any model, uh, model parameters, so the inertia and damping. So practically, we want just to control the torques, so we need to, to estimate or we need to know exactly what is the torque that we are controlling the motor, and we just get the output, so the position, the link, and the motor, so the deformation, and just by using this information, so the input and output information, we want to estimate the stiffness. So practically, we want to consider a completely unknown flexible joint, so we don't have any information whether it's inside our flexible transmission. The model, the, the behavior, uh, the parameters, we want just to give some input, take the output, and estimate the stiffness. So to do that, we start also in this case for the dynamic model of the, of the in the model side, we take the time uh, integration, so just this uh, equation. Now, also in this case, we want to uh, fit uh, the flexibility torque with a polynomial function, so a linear regressor, and using by some mathematical property of the integral, we get this relation. So practically we have uh, the motor inertia, the motor damping, we have the sum of uh, our uh, alpha values that we can put outside the integral for the property of the integral, and then we have to, these two integrals. So practically, what we know? We know the uh, motor position, we can estimate the motor uh, velocity by using the, our modified kinematic command factor. We uh, can compute this integral so we know the, the torques, and we know the, the polynomial function, the basis of uh, our polynomial function, so we can compute also the integral of this quantity. What we want to estimate in this case? So we need to estimate the alpha values uh, as before, so the, the parameters that uh, shapes our uh, fitting function, but also the motor inertia and the motor damping. So practically we consider um, a new parameter vector, an extended parameter vector that is composed by the alpha values, but also the motor inertia and motor damping. And also in this case, we want to estimate the, uh, the alpha values that minimize this error in this case. So the error between the integral of the command that torques minus uh, the fitting function. So in this case, we have this F function, so this is Jacobian for each step. We can collect in the, our data set the matrix A with all this uh, sample data and the vector B, in this case, with the integral of the motor torques that we can compute at each step. And simply we can see as before, okay, we can use a preceding version, we can, use, we can compute a least square estimation that, gives, uh, that minimizes this error. Also in this case, uh, um, we, and then we are able, from this parameter uh, eta, we are able to get two information. We can est extrapolate this, an estimation of the motor damping, an estimation, sorry, an estimation of the motor inertia, an estimation of the mo motor damping, and also an estimation of the alpha parameters that together with the, uh, our um, polynomial function basis gives us the, uh, the stiffness, the estimation of the stiffness. At this point, uh, we have to cope with uh, the noises. We decide to have, we can cope with the noise with two approaches. We can have um, um, sorry, no, in the, okay, let's first see uh, the recursively square. As I said, in the, in the previous work we presented a modified recursively square which uh, works with the inverse inverse of the correlation matrix, and uh, you do have to tune two parameters, so one for the um, stability factor, one for the gain. 
In this work, instead, we propose to use a, a QHAR recursivity square. So practically, it's just a recursivity square, but in this step, it's used the QR decomposition. Uh, this works directly in the, in the correlation matrix, which is much more uh, stable than the inverse of the correlation matrix, and doesn't need any design parameters. Practically, it's just based on the composition of the matrix, or the QR decomposition of the matrix A. We just recall that the matrix A is composed by this F vector. You just have to have the QR decomposition which is composed by uh, part Q and part R. And from the QR decomposition, you can just get the least square approximation using this relation. So it's a very simple to update the QR decomposition by considering, for example, um, uh, Gaussian rotation and so on, also I've called rotation, but you are able to uh, to update the estimation in this way, and practically each time you have a new sample, you put the new sample in, uh, in this part, you compute the QR decomposition of this, uh, this part, then you take the new Q, the new P, and you get the new estimation. Uh, practically you're just updating uh, the R part and the Q part, and you get the estimation of each step. This is very fast because updating the QR decomposition, it's uh, very fast approach, it's very useful online, it's very stable, and gives very good results. Also in this case, I, we use the, the VSA2, I will not recall it anymore. Uh, a first simulation that we propose is to have um, a small time drift, uh, small errors in the, our model. So we consider a small time drift for the stiffness of the spring, of the VSA2, and some error in the um, in, the, uh, in the motor inertia and motor damping. So practically this is the nominal one, and we uh, instead take a, a model that has a different values with respect to the nominal one. Also in this case we use the uh, main square error, the main square relative error percentage to, as index for the estimation. And we can see that by using the proposed method, we are able to get very good results and also to estimate a very good estimation for the motor inertia and motor damping. If we use a standard least square method, we are not getting a very good results. This is because the standard least square method try to, to get the whole information, but since the stiffness behavior change, changes over time, you just get the values of alpha that are able to, to catch the, the behavior uh, on the whole execution. So you just have a mean values for these values. At the end, the estimation is not correct. Uh, if you take our ver a previous presented method, so in the HRR, also in this case, we don't get very good uh, values because in this method, we consider to have uh, the knowledge about the motor inertia and motor damping. So since we have uh, simulated a robot with some error in motor inertia and motor damping, the result is not uh, very good. Even if uh, it's better than the least square method because here we use a recursively square method, which is able to, to cope with the variation of the flexible stiffness. Sorry. At this point, we have to consider the presence of a noise. And actually, we have two, two different sources of noise. We have practically a white Gaussian noise with zero mean on uh, the torque, because on the commanded torque. So you are controlling the torque, but actually uh, the robot is not able to execute exactly the torque that you uh, asked for because there are noises, because they're not perfect. So we model it as a Gaussian white noise. Instead, for the position of the motor and the link, you have another uh, noise that comes, for example, if you use a digital sensor like an encoder, as I said before, you have a noise due to the quantization and the discretization. While if you have an analogous sensor like a potentiometer, you, you can use just a white Gaussian noise. And to filter these errors, you can use two strategies. You, you can have a causal filter, so you just use uh, previous and current values of the quantity that you want to estimate, these have online capabilities because you don't need any uh, further information. 
or you can use a non-causal um, filter. But in this case, you need also associative data. Uh, then the only way to do that is to start to estimate uh, with a delay. So you collect some data and then you estimate a previous uh, values for the, the quantity that you want to estimate. So at this point, we do two assumptions. Uh, the first assumption is that the same non-causal action is applied to all the signal that are used in, in the recursive square. This means, means that uh, if you have the same delay for all the input of the recursive square, the result of the recursive square will have the same delay. Then we use the second assumption, that is the characteristic of the flexible transmission is assumed quasi-constant. So we assume that this changed very slowly. And this is true because actually uh, the variation of the characteristics changed, for example, because uh, you use uh, uh, the, the joint for a long period, so it the, the parts become warmer, so the stiffness of your spring changes, but it changes very slowly. Then in our estimation, we use, it, we use it, this assumption. Uh, for the, the estimation, so you, we use as causal filter, uh, kinematic calm, the modified the kinematic calm filter we have seen before. In the modified form, if you use a, a encoder, or in the standard form, if you use a potentiometer, so if you have a Gaussian white noise. For the non-causal filter, we use a stavisky goliath filter. Practically, you, with this filter, which is practically a first filter, you uh, consider to apply, to apply on a window of data W, uh, uh, associative fitting of a subset of the same data. So apparently you take the data and you try to fit a polynomial on this data. Uh, this gives, this have an analytical solution. So you don't have to, to f perform the fitting, but you have an analytical solution that can be implemented as a field filter. And this method gives also the possibility to estimate um, the time derivatives. Uh, so you can see here, for example, uh, in this plot, that, sorry, let's see, okay. In this plot, uh, the successive uh, estimation of this uh, noisy data. So practically, each time it takes uh, a window and try to fit this yellow polynomial of uh, this data, you can see how the, the, fitted polyno the fitted values is very near to the, the actual one. It has a very good property uh, for the estimation. So the idea at this point, this is one. Okay, we have our timeline. We are in the time step K. So we can use our causal filter, so our kinematic Kamman filter, to, S to obtain a filtering action on joint position and uh, motor position, then a filter version of the deformation of the transmission. On the other side, we can take uh, a window of values that goes from, a window of dimension W, so values that goes from K to K minus W, we use a, a zavisky goliath filter to filter the motor position, the, motor, uh, the link position, and uh, the um, command that talks. And this gives uh, an estimation of the motor position, uh, of the joint position, motor position, motor velocity, and uh, motor talks, but with a delay. So all the, these data comes with a delay of uh, half of the window. So you get this estimation, but you have, to, uh, you have to collect also the other data, which is exactly half of the window, before to have an estimation. You, put this, uh, you use these uh, estimated values with a delay on our QR recursive square, and you get an estimation on the alpha values, but also this estimation has this, the same delay of half, half of the window. <laughs> At this point, we use the assumption too. The assumption two it says that uh, the stiffness values is almost the same of the previous other of the stiffness values that we had with a, a with a delay of a, half of the window. So practically, we use the estimated values of alpha with this delay, but we use uh, the for the polynomial function. So for the basis, we use the filter version these times. This gives you that the polynomial function is composed by the alpha parameters that are the old one, but with the first assumption, the old one and the, uh, the current one are practically the same. And for, instead for the current values that we need in real time, we use uh, 
the ones that come from the causal filter. Now, uh, we compared these uh, results with this method uh, with uh, our uh, previous work, and we uh, considered uh, the, this model for the VSA2. We take for both methods the same sinusoidal input and noise, so practically we uh, simulated the same, um, the same input, the same joint that we have simulated in our previous work, and we showed that um, the behavior given by our new method is more or less the same. Uh, it's difficult to say if a method is better than another, but what we can say is that the error that comes is more or less in the same, uh, is on the same uh, quantity. So they, they can be compared, they can be, we can say that uh, the error is not, that the behavior of both estimation is more or less sim similar. But the particularity of the new presented method is that uh, we are not using the information about the motor damping inertia, but actually we are able also to obtain a very good estimation of these two values. We also uh, compared this work um, uh, we work on Menard et al. in ACRA 2013. Also in this case, we take the same cubic transmission, we take the same input, the same fit in polynomial, the same noises. Uh, in this, and also in this case, uh, we get uh, a result that can be compared. Also in this case, it's not simple to say a, a method is better than another, so the estimation is better than another, because you should, uh, you should have many um, many simulations, many experiments, you, you have to take a different kind of noise, different kind of input. But what we can say from this, uh, uh, this slides that if we take exactly the simulation that they proposed, uh, the results of our estimation is more or less the same. But also in this case, we are not using any information about uh, the motor inertia and motor damping, but actually we are able to estimate it. So with this part, I conclude this lecture. And uh, here you can find all the references of the paper that uh, presents the work that are uh, presented in this lecture. I believe, uh, I hope that uh, you have some more knowledge about the stiffness of the estimation and why this is useful for uh, compliant joints. Uh, this is actually a very active and also still ongoing uh, field because uh, you have seen a lot of, uh, of methods to estimate the stiffness, but we are still working on uh, methods, on implementing this method in real joints. Uh, probably, uh, I believe that uh, Giorgio is going to implement some of, of the method in the uh, QB uh, move or in future, uh, uh, future joints of QB. Uh, Giorgio is coming to say something. <laughs> Can you uh, the previous slide? Yes. And you talk about the noise in the encoder, okay? Yep. But digital encoders uh, nowadays uh, their error is near to zero. Actually uh, this is uh mm -hmm. You mean uh, in a much forward? Let's see if I'm able to go to the right slide. Okay, coming, I see here. Okay, my computer is, is trying to, to go to there. Okay, you mean this, this plot? Okay, actually uh, this, this uh, noise that you can see here is 
so this is the velocity. It's not the, the encoder. So in this case, we are just trying to use a classical uh, discrete time differentiation. Just take the, the previous sample minus the, the current sample minus the previous sample times the, the quantization, the, the, um, the period. Yes. Okay, the nice is just two things. You have a quantization level in your encoder. You can have a very small quantization level. In the experiments, the, uh, the quantization was around uh, 40,000 uh, levels. You have a very small level, yeah. But you have to, to also to consider that you have a discretization. So you are not taking, uh, you, the encoder and your sampling time are not synchronized at all, actually. So if you think that you are moving very slowly, your joint, because you are, for example, in this case, you are deforming very, uh, you have a very small deformation of uh, your uh, flexibility uh, transmission, flexible transmission, then you have very small variation. Then you change, as if you move very slowly, you change the quantization level, not on each sample, but you, for example, for 10 sample, you get the same quantization level, then you change, then uh, you see another sample in the same quantization level. Then when you, so you have some jumps, so you have just the quantization in your plots. If you try to just use uh, discrete time discretization, you get uh, jumps when uh, you change the level. It's not noise in the sense that there is a uh, white noise because you don't get exactly the point that you have. You get the point. But to the quantization, you have the error that's given the, from your quantization uh, range. And if, you, if the quantization changes also uh, due to the, your uh, sampling time, your discretization, you're not getting the, the quantization when you want. And the problem is when you move very slowly the joints. You can try to experience it. So you try to, uh, to take your encoder, try to move a very slowly the joints and try to, to estimate the, uh, the velocity, you get some jump. Then I will show you my uh, okay. experimental test. On okay. Thank you. Sure. Yes, I have a small question. Uh, in case your sprints would have very high stiffness, would that be a big problem or not? Very high stiffness means that... No, hysteresis. Sorry. Hysteresis? Yes. Oh, actually, I never tried it. So we never... <laughs> uh, I'm thinking how the, the fitting part works. <laughs> I don't know if the fitting part is able to catch this behavior because practically how does it works? It's try to, to accommodate the, fit, the polynomial uh, function on the part that you are using, on the part of the characteristic that you're using at that moment. Uh, the hysteresis gives you some jump, some irregular part in your uh, characteristic. Um, probably the stiffness estimation will jump too but uh, probably you, need, you will need some tune of the parameters. You have to put some forgetting factor because uh, the, the variation of the estimation will change too fast. And you have to probably also to find some trick to, or some variation of the method to deal with this problematic. So Is it important to know exactly the efficiencies of your gear train or not? Uh, not so important. I mean, clearly, if you have a... Okay, uh, the efficient, if you mean with efficiency, the, with the fact that maybe the, the exact uh, rapport between uh, one side and the other side is not exact, so it changed. It could be a problem. It could be a problem because uh, actually we are considering to have some torque in the motor side. Actually, you don't get the torque. You get something different. 
this goes, it depends on the behavior. Probably you can uh, put this also in, as a noise for the, for the torque, uh, for the input torque. As you see in the, in the slides, we have put some noise to, uh, to simulate such uh, problems, but you are not talking about noise, you are talking about very, pres very precise and structured uh, error, so I, I'm not sure uh, that uh, with this error you is able to get a very, very accurate stiffness estimation. Probably you just get some error in this stiffness estimation. Uh, probably the, the, works that w the method presented that works with the uh, residual base estimator, uh, probably they are more uh, uh, affected by these problematics because they are trying to estimate something uh, before. The methods instead that are working without probably are l less um, uh, modified by this characteristic, but if you not try, I, I, don't, I cannot give you an answer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, curiosity about the last work you showed us, uh, how many points did you use in the Savitsky Gorley filters? Filter? Um, in this case, I think uh, 200. Okay. 200 with a sampling time of 2 milliseconds around. Okay. And, uh, did you consider using directly a Kalman smoothing filter, or is there any particular reason you think this is not useful? You mean to use it directly a Kalman, uh, Kalman filter for it? Yes, yes, with a main estimation. So that okay, uh, let's consider that all these methods, so the, this uh, Savitsky Colai filter, the recursive square, the Kalman filter, are more or less all the same family, yeah. are more or less near there. Uh, the particular, the Kalman filter particularly is that you have to know, some, you have to have some knowledge of the covariance of uh, your process. It's what characterizes the Kalman filter with respect, for example, recursive square where you don't have any knowledge. You just put some, usually, I didn't say it, but when you initialize the recursive square, you just put a very high values for the covariance matrix. Say, okay, I don't know anything about the, uh, what is uh, the covariance of this process. I put the very high values and then the, the methods start to move and start to refine this covariance matrix. Probably, instead for the Savitsky Kolai filter, the very good property of this filter is this, you can have an analytical solution and you can apply a field filter. And also, it's not causal. And the good part for not being causal is that you can use also future uh, information. And this is very useful when you want also to estimate the time derivatives. Yeah, but also with the carbon smoother, you could do that. Uh, also be optimal. Yeah, as I, say, uh, as I say, they are all the same family. Probably you can find. Uh, you can find that uh, instead of using the the uh, the Kolai filter, use the other filter, and then the difference is just that they call the differently some gains, and then you can change variables and you get the same behavior. Right? Okay, we talked about that actually. Uh, probably with the methods developed by Sapienza, so our group, uh, we think we talked about if we can do that, we say no, we cannot do that. Just because we work from other side, it's one of the property of our method. They say, okay, other side in the human, what it means? I don't know. But maybe Giorgio can answer for the. The piece apart. Yes, I have two words to add to this. This is a very, very interesting topic. And it has a broad number of complications. So, using, finding an algorithm that can be used to measure the stiffness in humans in real time could be really a small revolution also in medicine. Because measuring the stiffness of the muscular system is used during those some kinds of situations. We also are trying to work very hard on 
this, but it's, uh, it is very difficult. And uh, we are encountering the same problem that Maurizio was mentioning. It is uh, essentially when you want to measure the series from the humans, you don't know what the human is doing, what the human is pretending to do. It's, it's really good. So you have just half of the system in your application. And this is what makes it uh, really, really difficult. If you remember, uh, He is measuring the signals of humans, but uh, the way he does it is uh, through repeating experiments uh, thousands of times, hundreds of times, and he perturbs the, your trajectory a little, sometimes not always, mm -hmm. because otherwise, otherwise you will get used to it. And it's, it's a very, very complex measurement process that the one which is used tonight now will be measuring the signals of humans. But still, the application of this kind of I think the estimation of the stiffness uh, strongly relates to the motion of the actuator you apply. So, is there an optimal approach for this motion for estimating the stiffness? Um, let's say that the, the answer is twofold. From one side, um, I think, I, I'm, at least I can talk for uh, our works they are not dependent on the motion. I mean, uh, you can move the, your robots or your joint in the way you want and you get the estimation for one side. The other, the other side, there's the, the persistent excitation. You have to excitate your, uh, your system. So if you, are too, if you are moving, let's say, uh, the worst case, if you are not moving your robot, you are not estimating anything. Um, so maybe uh, you can try to work in a way that you move the robot in order to maximize the persistent excitation. Probably you can find some relation that gives you a motion to that. But the basic idea of this works is that um, you use these methods to estimate online the stiffness and then use this information to control the, the motor. So you don't want to um, constrain your joint to have some specific motion because you have to use the estimated the stiffness. You want to use the stiffness, for example, to do the feedback linearization or to do the gravity cancellation, whatever you want. Uh, there is work in, I think, in the IFAC paper and also in the IJR paper where we close the loop. We take the stiffness and we put the stiffness uh, to compute all the, uh, the terms that you need for the feedback linearization that uh, Professor Deluga showed. And clearly, you get good results when, uh, only when the, only after a transient phase. When the stiffness starts to be tracked, you get, you get the same results of the really stiff stiffness. So it would be good to have an initial phase where you identify. Probably, probably uh, I mean, if I have to use it for a real application, probably I will do it in this way. I will start with a, initial motion, predefined motion that you know that uh, the, uh, your estimation converges in this motion and then from that point you start to do, to work with the, the join. May, probably one well, thing that we never, we have never done but it's, I think it's smarter things to do is every time maybe you start with a previous uh, estimation. So you work with your robot, you do an estimation, okay maybe the day after the uh, the stiffness behavior changed a little bit because it's a different temperature. You're not using the joint for a week uh, or whatever you want, but this humidity or whatever you want. But uh, maybe the previous estimation was already near to the actual one. Then you start for that estimation and you have already a good estimation. Okay. You're welcome. There are more questions, I would say, 
Thanks a lot, Maurizio. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And also, I would like to thank George that gives me some of the slides because some half of the, of the works uh, is from his side. So, thank you. Now it's time for the coffee break. Okay. <laughs>